So hello everyone, sorry about that. Um, my name is Mike Kelly and for those who don't know, you, know me, which is probably a lot of you, uh, I'm a consultant and an API technologist from the UK. Uh, I'm responsible for API, API technologies that are used all over the world uh, by some of the biggest players such as Amazon, Yahoo, Microsoft and BSkyB. Uh, having been involved in cloud computing since uh, the early 2000s, back when it was called managed services, uh, it's really interesting to see this stuff finally coming into fruition uh, in the financial services world. Uh, so when I first started putting this thought together, I was planning to jump straight into some quite detailed tactics around API design. Um, and then I thought, with all this talk of sort of unbundling and feeling sorry for the banks, how, I can, how can I most help them in their hour of need? Uh, and rather than just tell them what to do, how can I help them help themselves? Um, and I remembered this saying, give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day. Uh, give him a fishing rod and he'll break it up for firewood uh, or he'll swap it for a fish. So what I want to talk about today uh, are some strategies around open banking, specifically uh, why it's a good idea, um, uh, when to start, attracting third parties to your platform, building a growing partner ecosystem, and ultimately producing a better overall experience for your customers. I guess the first point to address is why bother? So open banking is on the horizon, in my opinion. Third parties will be given open access to customer accounts and banking services, and this will cause an explosion of innovation, competition, and new business in the financial services world. New channels and revenue streams will emerge of which banks could become major beneficiaries. But those that don't adopt an open strategy will be left behind. As the author Alan Watts put it in his book, The Wisdom of Insecurity, the only way to make sense out of change is to plunge into it, move with it, and join the dance. But what will open, will open banking actually happen? When and how serious is it? Well, I'd say it's probably about as serious as the internet. And everybody knows the internet is serious business. <laughs> in short, open banking will happen because regulators are making it law across the EU. The regulation in question is the second iteration of something called the Payment Services Directive, or PSD2. For the uninitiated, it is actually as boring as it sounds. It's essentially a 200-page yawn fest. Uh, but the implications it has in practice aren't boring at all. So the most important part of PSD2, uh, for, at least from an open banking perspective, is a section called Access to Accounts, or Access to A. Its goal is to create competition in the payment space by opening up banking systems to third parties. Uh, this slide shows the current state of card processing fees. As I'm sure many of you are aware, the situation right now is merchants like Amazon, uh, local news agents lose between 1% to 2% of their sales on something called a merchant service charge. Uh, that's basically made up of interchange uh, scheme fees and processing margin. The interchange is paid to the issuing bank, which is the customer's bank. Uh, the scheme fee is paid to Visa and MasterCard, and the processing margin is retained by the merchant's bank. So by exposing the account information uh, and payment services programmatically, access to a aims to enable the development of alternatives to card payments. So the example on this slide shows at a high level uh, what that might look like. Firstly, Amazon, and that's number one, firstly, Amazon asks the customer for, for permission to instruct a payment. Uh, next, the customer tells the bank they grant this permission uh, using some kind of protocol, uh, probably OAuth. And finally, Amazon instructs a faster payment to themselves from the customer's account. The end result is a real-time transaction that requires no intermediaries and would be a fraction of the cost of the card schemes. So in opening up banks, Access to A will effectively hand over the API keys to the kingdom. The catch, though, is that PSD2 will not come into effect until 2017, at the end of 2017. So it's a sort of a very slow, uncomfortable Trojan horse for the fintech industry. But it has had the immediate effect of giving fintech a regulatory green light on open APIs. And I think it goes without saying that fintech is a huge area of growth at the moment. Uh, these stats show, uh, show funding in fintech has gone from less than $1 billion in Q2 2010 to over $3 billion in Q1 2015. Fascinatingly, those numbers are on the back of these two stats, which trended downwards leading into 2010. Uh, this is a bit where I'd like somebody from the crowd to get involved. Does anybody have any idea what these numbers are? I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't know. So actually, I'm not surprised you didn't get it. It's actually fishing boat, de fishing boat deaths and Kentucky marriages. So uh, there's an awesome website, by the way, called Spurious Correlations. If you like these, there's tons of them on there. It's really good. They made it into a book as well. It's awesome. 
Yeah. Um, so fintech is growing because the companies are unimpaired by legacy, they're highly focused in their propositions, and they're nimble in their implementation. It's impossible for banks to keep pace, and as a result, retail banking has started to unbundle. Uh, that process will accelerate as open banking phases in. Uh, the future belongs to what Simon Cabri called the marketplace bank, and that is a bank that exposes their services as an open platform, attracts third-party providers, and fosters a marketplace of services from which their customers can pick and choose. So, some bad news for incumbent banks. Challenger banks are here. They don't have legacy technology or financial products to support, and they already have APIs. But the good news is you have all the customers, at least for now. The problem is, as the challenger banks naturally evolve into marketplace banks with integrations to all the latest, um, the latest consumer fintech apps, their proposition becomes increasingly more compelling to customers. Eventually, you will start losing those customers. This is why the most important piece of strategic advice you can take away is start shipping an open banking platform now. Don't wait for PSD2. Don't wait for standards to emerge. Ship your own API as soon as possible. And to do that, you need to keep in mind two important principles. Firstly, the principle of simplicity. This principle should apply to all areas of your API program, whether it's the API's technical design or the contract management process for third parties. Keeping things simple will reduce the barriers to option for third parties and constrain the scope so you can meet your deadlines. And the second principle is iteration. So APIs can be developed just as iteratively as web apps. Um, your first release could be purely OAuth endpoints, and that would allow third parties to provide, for example, login with your bank account feature. The second iteration could add endpoints for account information. The third iteration could add transaction lists. The fourth could add uh, in instructing payments, and so on. But how do you know where to start? So APIs are essentially just machines talking to other machines. But machines, for the most part, don't spontaneously decide to talk to one another. They're codified to do so by people solving specific problems. And well-designed well APIs focus on the people and solving their problems. And this is often referred to as developer experience or sometimes API user experience. Developer experience is not something you want to get wrong. If you do, you're going to get reactions like this guy. And nobody wants that. I'll let that loop a couple more times just so you can sink in. It's pretty serious. So it's important to recognize there are many different types of developers out there. So they could be split up. You could segment them by, say, uh, the type of organization they're working in. So they could be working in a startup. They could be working in a large corporation. Or they could be a lone developer at a hackathon. Likewise, you could split them up by, say, the type of development they do. They do mobile dev. They do web dev. They could be doing back-end systems integration. Or you could even split them up by the current problem they're trying to solve. They could be discovering what your API is capable of. They could be, um, they could be building an integration. Or they could be debugging a problem they've, they've encountered in, in production. And in order to solve this sort of broad problem of what kind of developers you have, you need to develop developer personas. So developer personas are a really important way of uh, a frame of reference for thinking about features you're developing. So the key to a successful road, roadmap is to be use case driven. If a feature can't be immediately develop, uh, delivered or, and it doesn't provide value for one of the developer, developer personas, then take it off the roadmap. So apart from the obvious features like account information, listing transactions, and instructing transactions, what are some of the features that you should be considering? So firstly, a developer site. So developer sites are really important, and this can actually be delivered before the API itself is delivered. It can explain the roadmap, first of all. It can provide a pre-release documentation so developers can see what your API is going to actually look like on the wire. And it can be used to build and maintain a mailing list of potential third-party providers. And when you do this, please make sure that you involve web UX people. It's really important to get this right. Don't just dump information at people. Developers are people too, uh, and they have to read stuff and, and get to information quickly. Uh, use analytics and do split testing. Um, there's a whole bunch of information on, on how to do this. Uh, it's a pretty common web application problem, and developer portals shouldn't be seen as any different. Uh, again, SEO is another common web application um, area that, that, should be, that should be included in your developer program. Uh, and, and, and lastly, it should be developed um, and it should be targeted to these developer personas that you've come up with. 
So another feature that you're going to need is sandboxes. So sandboxes are effectively a way of developers being able to sort of play with your system uh, and learn through play. And it's really important, um, and it's something that often a lot of companies who have APIs don't get right. Um, first of all, they make their sandboxes, they hide their sandboxes behind authentication. And in my opinion, a good sandbox, at least for onboarding developers, should actually be available to the general public. They should be able to try it out. They should be able to share it with fellow developers without them even having to um, have any login credentials to see it. Um, on top of that, you need to be able to simulate customer behavior so that people can, say, uh, demonstrate an ATM withdrawal or a card payment, a direct debit being taken out. Uh, dress changes, all these kind of scenarios need to be uh, played out so that the developers can actually see the outcomes in the sandboxes. Another thing that's really, really important is test environments. Uh, test environments are absolutely, absolutely vital, especially when you're integrating with fintech companies. Fintech companies will have continued integration servers, they'll have UAT environments, they'll have pre-production, and each of these need to be con uh, connected to test environments. They'll be wanting to constantly test their changes against your system. Uh, and if you don't provide test environments, they'll, they'll use another provider. Um, on top of that, you need seed data, you need, simulator, and you need uh, simulators, and you need test harnesses as well. Uh, documentation is, is, is a big point. Um, there's a lot to be said about that, probably a talk in and of itself. Um, to keep it short, um, the, the documentation has to be clear and concise. It's absolutely vital that it doesn't go on and on. Uh, it needs to be practical. It needs to have code examples. Uh, again, SEO is really, really important. A lot of developers will go to Google first in order to find uh, the problem they're solving. Uh, and if you don't have good SEO, then they, they, they won't reach your website. Um, and also, obviously, think about documentation frameworks like Swagger. So companies have solved these documentation problems before, and uh, frameworks like Swagger are... Um, really interesting way of solving that problem. So um, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, actually, um, I've been involved in something called HAL, uh, which is a format that's been used by uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, a bunch more companies around the world uh, to build their APIs. And it's something I'm quite passionate about. Um, it's this idea of discoverability. And the idea is that you don't sort of dump documentation around your API and its capabilities on developers in one large document. You actually try and uh, develop uh, what's called phase disclosure. So there's a design principle that's actually used on the London Underground called phase disclosure. The idea of this is to reduce uh, dwell time in uh, parts of the underground. And the way that they do this is by only providing the information that is absolutely necessary in order to make a decision at what they describe decision points in the underground. Uh, and they've optimized this. Um, to a point where they can, uh, they can prove that, that their design actually uh, s saves, saves time for commuters by reducing the amount of uh, dwelling that uh, commuters do. Uh, and similarly, hypermedia and, and hypertext has the same principle of discoverability in it, in that it's trying to expose the capabilities of an API in a sort of phased way. So at any point in the API, you only have available to you the next possible transitions. It's not a huge dump of the entire API in one document. It's actually a sort of phased disclosure. So in conclusion, um, I would say start now, keep it simple, work iteratively, and try not to upset this guy. Thanks. <laughs>